Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about my book, A Cultural Theory of International Relations. As some of you may know, it is the second volume in a trilogy that attempts to develop a theory of political order and a theory of international relations and to make strong connections between the two. In a previous talk, I described at some length the tragic vision of politics, which is the first volume in this uh, series. This first volume uh, develops the epistemology and ontology that I apply in cultural theory. Uh, it also uh, builds on Thucydides' uh, understanding of the relationship between political order and international relations um, and develops uh, what I call uh, classical realism, of whom Hans Morgenthau is probably the uh, leading 20th century exponent. That book was published in 2003. Cultural Theory of International Relations appeared in 2008. Uh, it too was timely in the sense that following the end of the Cold War, so-called identity politics emerged uh, everywhere uh, as a driver of political behavior, something that was uh, important as well to international relations theories, which moved away from structural theories like neorealism to understand more the motives that actors had for behavior. Cultural theory uh, spoke to this in the sense that it creates a paradigm of politics based on what the Greeks call thumos, uh, in English T-H-U-M-O-S, and I'll elaborate in more detail in due course here. But briefly, uh, thumos captures our understanding that we're all driven by strong desires for self-esteem. We want to feel good about ourselves and feel good about ourselves when we win the approbation of others who count, our peer group, our society. This is a powerful political motive at every level of social aggregation. It had largely been ignored in international relations theory. Uh, the last person whom we might consider to some extent a political or an international relations theorist who noted its importance was Max Weber, who said in almost a throwaway line that conflicts of interests between states are always amenable to negotiation and settlement. But those where honor is involved, those conflicts are far more intractable. He traced World War I uh, to this latter concern, and particularly uh, the dimension of German-French relations and the conflict associated with the two countries for a long period of time. Uh, in cultural theory, I build on the Greek understanding of human nature that I laid out in the tragic vision of politics. This tripartite division that gives equal emphasis to appetite, which we all understand, uh, thumos, which I'll elaborate on, and reason. Now, uh, appetite 
when it comes to politics is usually the appetite for material well-being. Thumos, as I noted, is a drive uh, for self-esteem, which is achieved by winning the recognition and approbation of others who matter. It confers status, and with higher status, we feel better about ourselves. This is not merely an ancient understanding of human nature. It's very modern in its applications. The World Values Survey has for some years revealed across countries and cultures that when people reach a certain level of affluence and not a very high degree of wealth and are then given a choice between another increment of wealth or an increment of status, increasingly choose status over wealth. So appetite is important uh, for substantive and psychological reasons, but once it's to some degree satisfied, other things become come into play and become at least as important, if not more so. And reason, here the Greeks differed from the modern counterparts who have hollowed out our understanding of reason, reducing it uh, in the words of David Hume to the slave of the passions. Reason, as moderns understand it, is what mediates between our appetites and the world. Uh, for the ancient Greeks, they understood two levels of reason. This, what Max Weber called instrumental reason, and reason as a drive in its own right that sought to first constrain and then educate appetite and thumos alike to work with it toward a common goal. And that common goal was a happy life. Reason helped people discover what would really make them happy. And then to constrain appetite and thumos so it didn't prevent them from reaching it. This is something we see, for example, with our children. The most difficult thing in raising, especially young children, but as we all know, teenagers as well, is encouraging them not to have too much of anything, to leave whatever it is, chocolate cake, for others, and also to understand the value of deferred gratification. That if you put off instant gratification, that longer term gratification uh, may bring much greater uh, rewards. So this is part and parcel of what the Greeks were talking about, of how uh, reason can first constrain and then educate our appetites and our, our thumos. If we look at these three drives, um, we see that um, each is associated uh, with a different kind of hierarchy. Uh, so thumos gives rise to what can be called clientelist hierarchies. There is more and more status as you ascend toward the apex of the hierarchy. At the same time, there are more responsibilities. Those toward the top assume obligations to those beneath them. So, generally, Clientelist hierarchies are set up 
to create a trade-off that satisfies everybody. The people at the top receive honor and respect from those beneath them, and they in turn are expected to provide very practical economic and security advantages to those beneath them. Those at the top are constrained by thick rule packages that require self-restraint on their part to prevent them from abusing their powers. If the system works, everybody benefits. In international relations, we see such a uh, world emerging, at least in theory, in 5th century Greece, characterized by the concept of hegemonia. Uh, now, through Latin, English and other modern languages get the word hegemony, but that means quite something different in modern parlance. For the ancient Greeks, hegemonia was an honorific status. It was conferred on you by other city-states for what you had done to benefit the community as a whole. Sparta and Athens were hegemons because of their cooperation and their courage in defeating the Persian invaders. Uh, Athens also was conferred hegemonia for clearing the seas of pirates, for creating a common currency, for allowing others to have access to its markets and its law courts. So this is a system that in practice uh, is designed to give everybody something and a vested interest in having it function and continue. We see uh, evidence of it as well in China, in the Ming Empire, where exactly the same kind of clientelist relationship 